All right, so I'm going to be inking this Rip Cerebus strip. Sorry for all the ambient noise you're going to get of me messing with pens and stuff. Last night, I printed out the blue line. So you can see we have this blue reproduction here. Let's see how in focus. Ooh, that's, that looks like a sweet spot. Printed out in a cyan ink. So when I ink over it and scan it back in, Sean can edit out the blue line and just focus on the black. Uh, last night, I got a little carried away as I tend to do and inked in the panel borders already and the word balloons. Um, and I did some taping. I missed, missed one here. I tape off the panel borders. So I don't have to be super careful about stopping my lines, which is especially helpful with all of the really fine cross hatching. It's like extra stress on the wrist. Having to get good at stopping. Um, so we've got two Cerebus here that Dave's going to draw two self portraits of me. Um, I'm going to draw one of them, but Dave also wants me to scan it with myself uninked in this one. And he's going to go ahead and ink that on a later print of just the first panel, I think is what he was talking about. So I'm going to ink the background and then scan it. And then I'll ink that face. Um, right now I have the board taped off to work on this re Kirby recreation panel. When I'm getting started, really, like if I haven't been inking in a while. Hey, Simon. Hi, Simon. How's it going? Hopefully you can hear me. Let me open up the chat too. I'm probably not going to look at the chat very much. This is the kind of thing where you want to get into the zone, but I can talk to people while I go. Um, that, that doesn't usually distract me. I'm still getting set up, getting the ink ready. And then I'm going to have, it's going to, probably take me a couple tries to find the, the brush I want to use. I have a whole bunch of them in there. And some of them get better results than others. So I have to find the good one usually. I used to have a category system, but it fell apart. And I'm putting some fresh ink. And Vetus is here. Hey, Vetus. Vetus, you've been doing recreations too. You know what this is about. Let me see if I can. Okay, hopefully that keeps me. Hey Vitas, can you t can you tell me in the chat is my screen the one that's blown up or does it show like the gallery view for everyone? Okay, good. That's hopefully how it's going to record. I'm still figuring figuring out the ins and outs of what's what on Zoom. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to start with this Rip Kirby recreation because that just helps me get in the mindset of like the brush strokes again. It's been a while. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've done like some serious inking and sometimes it takes me 
a bit to get my brain going back in that direction. And you guys are free to turn on your audio and, and chatter at me. Um, so I'm focusing on trying to get these all in one go. But I'm not quite in the flow state yet, so I sucked and I got to touch it up a little bit. I also got to make sure that this brush is really going to do the shapes that I want it to do. Some brushes are better for certain things. Um, this one looks like it's gonna be pretty good. Sorry if I lean my head in the way there. I'll try and keep that out of it. This brush is really good for those big juicy strokes like that. I can tell that it's not going to be the best for the little teeny tiny lines. It just feels a little soft and I can see the way it's flaring out a little bit at the end. Yeah, it's not holding the fine line proper. Well, I'll do some of the big inking with this. We got two Simons. I couldn't get my um, microphone to work because so I had to restart the um, thing. I think it's probably me twice. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, knew that. I was. I was just wondering if Dave gave you sort of specific directions about how to ink, or did he just sort of leave you to, to you know, sort of do it yourself the best way that you thought? Um, mostly just like when I did the trial page, I'm going to switch the brush here, by the way, I don't like that one. Um, when I did the trial page, actually, I'm going to get a brand new brush. How about that? Let's break one in live. Um, when I when I did the trial pages, I kind of just did my own thing for the most part. Most of what I did in volume one was just me doing it how I did it. Um, then when we were working on You Don't Know Jack, like after the whole thing was all all done and put together, he he went back and was asking me, hi Aaron, see you logged in. Um, Dave was asking me to go back and like thicken up a lot of the lines and we talked about like i wasn't one thing I, I was really baffled by especially looking at stan drake was some of his choice of where to put the thick lines and i was hoping for instruction from dave on how to make those choices but he said well you know just put them in the places that make sense and then those those ones that you're looking at Drake doing that don't make sense, you know, just kind of hang off until you understand, <laughs> until you understand that choice. Um, so I don't know, I have to go back through and thicken a lot of stuff up and in certain places, like if you look at some of the original art that I posted um, versus some of what prints, sometimes I chose to go back to the first instinct I had. And luckily we had scans of it before I went and like thicken things up. Um, so sometimes I wanted to go back. Like I just wasn't making good choices about when and where to thicken. But that's, that's like about it. I mean, there's some like technical instruction he gave me, but I never really used much of it. <laughs> it had a lot to do with like how often you should be cleaning your brush how obsessively you should be cleaning your brush and I thought there's no way like this is ideally a flow state kind of thing and if you're
cleaning your brush every 10 minutes, like just not staying in the flow. So I don't know if that's what Dave was doing. I don't know if he was actually cleaning his brush that frequently. Seems seems a little much to me. Like I don't I don't feel like I need to do that. Does that, that kind of answer the... Yeah, yeah, I was just, because he, he strikes me as somebody who'd be keen for somebody to find their own way, but so much of um, it is about, like, very specific inking styles and very specific sort of techniques. So, yeah, I was just wondering which way he, he sort of leaned. And Dave's interesting in that he'll, he's kind of both, right? He's very, very... Uh, I want to use the right word, like specific. <laughs> I don't want to say picky. He's not picky because he gave me a lot of freedom as well, but he's very like, you know, he goes into everything. I mean, that's what the whole book is, right? It's like this mm. super insanely detailed account of everything, which is how he thinks. Um, but then there is that whole, like, I don't know, Gerhard's going to do Gerhard's going to do Gerhard. Mm. and it's it's interesting and you know same thing like Carson's going to do cars it's it was an interesting yeah learning how to navigate that like when is he going to want it done exactly one way and when is it just like go do your thing um, a, a lot of the time and I think Sean could probably attest to this too on a lot of the stuff that they worked on together. A lot of the time Dave will say, okay, this is what I want. Go make it. And, and you'll be like, well, that's very vague. And I know if I go do it, you're going to come back at me with <laughs> like all these revisions. So <laughs> I don't want to spend any time on it until I know exactly what you want. Um, and he'll say, well, I can't tell you exactly what I want until I see a finished product. So the temptation is to do like a half-assed job to like, okay, here's, here's a thought, like, tell me now how to take it from here. But he doesn't really want to see a half-assed job either. He wants to see like a finished version. So the big example of that I could think of was the and I notice I'm spinning my paper. If I was actually really, really in the zone that I need to be in, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be spinning my paper. But I haven't done this in a while. Um, anyways, with the Hermitage Awesomes, that Heritage Auctions parody catalog we did, he told me, "Oh, I want to make a Heritage Auctions parody catalog. Go, go make the whole thing for me." And I was like what are you talking about? Like, I never, I've never even looked at one of those. Like, I have no idea what you're looking for. Like how much, you know, I thought it was supposed to be serious at first, as far as I know, like the reason it wound up being a parody is because I didn't know how to write it serious. And so I was just putting in like parody filler text just to kind of give Dave the look of what it looked like. And then when he came back, it was like, oh yeah, parody was what I wanted. And then he took a lot of what I wrote and modified it or just overwrote it. Uh, so that that was kind of oftentimes the relationship. But the temptation in that is to then not put much time or effort into anything in the front end because you like, well, this is just gonna change. But, you know, it, I mean, we got we got good products in the end. So, mm. and with Strange Death, it was a little different, right? It's his vision. He sends me the the layouts, and I finish them accordingly. There was one time where his photo that he had was so bad, like the only photo he'd been able to find of the the people that Hugh, Hugh Gravitt, the guy who ran over Margaret Mitchell, taxi cab driver who ran over Margaret Mitchell, he had a photo of them going into court and it was such a bad blurry photo. And I like Dave could take that photo 
and turn it into a fine drawing because he's good at that. <laughs> I kind of really need to see it. I'm not very good at like making stuff up. Um, so I went like, God, can I find a better photo? And I, I did. I found a, I found a much higher quality photo. And then I thought that photo worked very well. It, like I could change the composition and actually make the composition of the page stronger. I thought, oh God, Dave's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> and I sent it over and he said, hey, this is, you know, this is actually really great. Keep, keep that version. So even in the actual like body of Strange Death of Alex Raymond itself, normally it was not very collaborative. It was just like, this is what Dave wants, go draw it. Um, but if I did legitimately find a better solution, he would, he was willing to accept it. Um, you know, that was the one time. The other times it was like, nope, that's not what I want. And I, okay, it's your book. So it's definitely Dave's book then? Yeah, well, I mean, the end is mine. Apart from the <laughs> ending, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's Dave's book, but the, yeah, there's a, there's a, I don't know how many pages it was, 30, 40 pages that I wrote and designed and did the art for all myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that, did you know anything about how Dave was going to end it or was it just, this is how I think it should end. That's how it should be round up. It's more of like, look, this is what I got left with, right? This is where <laughs> Dave quit. Um, and I want to make sure that that is on the record because it's, it's wonderful, wonderful comics that he made, you know? <laughs> and everyone wants this book and he was just going to walk away from it. But there's there's his 180 some odd pages and then however much I contributed, like we're just gonna shelf all of that after all these years of people waiting. Like, I don't know, that, as someone who got involved in the book because I'm a fan of it and w just wanted to see it, that didn't set right. You know, I know everyone else is waiting to see it. So, so okay, let's try and find a way to release it. Seems weird to just have a book go up to a certain page and then be like, and then he quit <laughs> like with no more, you know, like there's just no, it doesn't have a readable ending to it in that way. So I, I thought I saw a way to make an ending that felt like, even though it's not the end to the story that Dave was telling, it's like an end to the reading experience of the book that you're holding. That was important to me. Um, because there's projects like Barry Windsor Smith's Storytellers where they'll they'll print the here's how much got done and here's some unfinished pages and I mean that's cool like you want that stuff on record but I feel like there was a there was a way to go with it you know me and Sean talked about it a lot like are we gonna just release this as like <laughs> the here's here's as far as it got and that's it and maybe put an essay. Or like, could I wrap that essay component of what happened into a story itself? And uh, we came up with a solution that we're both pretty excited about. It, it, it like thematically, it works, and the the visuals that we came up with that I came up with for that work pretty well, I think, in the theme. Yeah, it's great because like. Uh... You know, with most unfinished work, like box art of few, you don't know what you really intended. But in this case, you've got the, you've got the layouts and you've got the artist himself. You know, so maybe it's not the actual authentic drawings all the way, but it's as close as you can get. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's still not like what he intended in terms of, all right, he's got... I don't know, two or three more volumes worth of material that I thought we were going to be doing. Oh, wow. Um, there was definitely going to be volume three and volume four. I got, I got the first 21 pages of volume three. And then that 
once Dave realized I wasn't, I was going to be drawing them until I had, well, basically the sticking point came down to, um, I, I kept insisting that I can't just in terms of my career, I can't justify any more time on this book until volume one is published because, you know, I'm, I, I was at the time, I now have achieved it trying to get a full-time job in higher education teaching. And an important component of that is your resume. Um, if I have a book coming out that's published, that looks good on the resume. It shows I've been active. But if that book that has been sitting on the shelf for like four years, five years at, at that point, doesn't come out, then I need to go back to my painting and start getting my work into shows again and stuff. And that, you know, that was something I told Dave many times and, you know, it just never really led to the book coming out. Um, so I was like, I can't, I can't do any more until that comes out. And my preference was always to have the whole volume worth of layouts ready and then I could work on all at once because like, you know, right now, while I'm tracing this Raymond thing, I'm trying to get back into the state of like syncing up with my brush, basically. Um, if I have 50 pages all in a row that I can ink and that's what I do for the summer, I can really get into the flow and make some great art. If it's just like two pages here, and then in a couple of weeks, I get another fax and I spend a week putting it together in Photoshop. And then I do two pages here. Like it's always going to be half results. Mm. Um, so it came down to like, he had sent me 20 pages of what would have been volume three. And those are all in the book. Uh, you know, th those are in the book that's coming out. Okay. And I was like, I, he, he had called me, he sent me a bunch of these brushes. <laughs> I was like, so you're getting to work on volume three, right? I was like, no, man, I already told you, like, I can't do that until volume one is like on shelves. And I think the California test edition was a way to say, oh, it's published. It's out now. It's like, no, like in, in stores on shelves where people can buy it, you know, I can say it's a published book like that. If that goes on my resume, then I can justify taking another year off, not painting. Uh, if I don't have that line on my resume, then I'll focus on my work until we're ready to go. Like whether that be four years from now or however long you need to be to be comfortable publishing volume one, then I can get back to work. And if that lets you have, um, if that lets you have all of volume three mocked up even better, because then I can just do it all and I can take a summer off or whatever and just do it all in one big batch. Um, and I think at that point, it was like, you know, it's not financially viable for him. The, the, the test edition thing didn't go the way he wanted. COVID hit, so he couldn't really do the tour that he wanted to do. And that's, that's when he walked away, which, you know, is unfortunate because there, there is like his ending. I don't know, you know, that's, but I don't. I don't, I don't know that he knows what it will be yet either. He's still doing the research yeah. for it. So that, that's kind of wh where I have to say, okay, then for the book at hand, can I create an ending to the reading experience that kind of acknowledges, like the book becomes a story about itself. Uh, and Dave's always treated it that way anyway. So it makes sense. You have like Barry Windsor Smith's Storytellers I mean, he kind of tried to pull that meta trick too, but it just didn't work as well because it didn't make as much sense in the context of what he'd already built. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it's like the whole book is us sitting there talking about making the book anyways. So I think it's perfectly fine to wrap that. Like with me and Sean joked, we almost called it the strange death of the strange death of Alex Raymond. Yeah, <laughs> except it's not dead yet. Yeah, but like the, it's the, you know, that's like the version we're releasing is like, here's the book that, that wraps up talking about how it all fell apart in the end. But that we decided that like for 
those of us who have been following the project, that title might make sense, but it looked terrible on, we actually mocked up the cover that way and <laughs> it just looked terrible on the cover. And, um, you know, we sent it out to a couple of people and they were like, man, anyone who's not been following this the whole time is going to have no, no clue what that means. It's, it's like, what in the world is this? Like, this is already a confusing book and now we've got this confusing title. So we just, okay, we'll just keep it. Well, maybe another add on. Anyway, the I'm, just strange death up, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, it looks like this is doing really well. So we've waited this long. I guess I can wait longer, you know, for a follow up. But it looks like it's getting good response and we'll see how the sales are. I'm proud to be sponsoring. Yeah, yeah we appreciate it. I mean, I don't think there will be a follow up. We, I, I tried to tell Dave, like, hey, because he just thinks the book won't sell. Uh, and it's been like, hey, man, like the, you know, he thinks it would only be like 200 people interested. And it's like, well, we've already sold, you know, 520 okay. copies at this point, And it's doing really I just, well on I Amazon. Just on there. All right. Well, I got to go. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for dropping in. Oh, there's a lot of people here. Wow. <laughs> hey, everybody. I apologize if my big head keeps getting in the way. He's the one that did my grabbing on It's very difficult sometimes to do this and actually hold a healthy posture. I'm very tempted to go like this. One thing that to notice about inking in this style. It's going to be tomorrow's shorts. Is um, I'm trying to think in terms of shape on these big areas. I'm going ahead and outlining it and filling it in, but uh, so Simon was asking earlier about did Dave give me instructions on how to do this? A lot of the instruction basically just came from tracing Raymond panels like I'm doing now and trying to figure out what was he doing? What was he doing with the brush to get the results that he got? Um, I talked to Sean about that a little bit in that the Strange Death of Alex Raymond video we did for the Living the Line YouTube channel with the stroke sheet I came up with, trying to learn the vocabulary that Raymond had of, of shapes. Um, oh yeah, my hand's shaky. But trying to learn to construct these images out of those same shapes versus what I call drawing, which is people like kind of outline everything and fill it in. And they're like, oh, they're like describing every detail very accurately rather than abstracting it down into these simpler shapes and then piling them on top of each other. And my tendency before this was more to draw, like try and get everything super accurate. Okay, now we're getting into the super fine lines. Yeah, I'd never really thought about the actual process of inking this stuff because just watching you do it, you know, you're saying it's just sort of like not drawing, but, you know, placing shapes on top of each other it's yeah, it just gives a really weird I, a different perspective you know yeah and i wish i eventually i'll do a video it's just too hard to do it while i'm actually trying to accomplish something that looks good too but 
um, I'll do a video for the Living the Line channel to try and explain what I mean in the difference between drawing, like in, in the, the sense where I'm being a little bit critical of like people, and there's plenty of artists who do it who I like their work. So I guess I shouldn't even say critical, but I'm almost using it in a derogatory sense. Like they're doing too much drawing. Um, there's not enough like calligraphy to it or something. And so that that is a discussion that I would like to be more clear about because a lot of people probably wonder what I'm talking about. Um, but one of the big components of that is yeah, outlining things and then filling it in, which on a big area like this, of course that makes sense to outline it and fill it in. But there is a sense that this, this right here should just be one big stroke that I could have put in from the get go. And my sense is that that's probably how Raymond did it. And then he probably just did a big stroke like that. And if I were, if I had been doing a lot of inking recently, that's more of how I would have approached it because I would have been more confident in my control of the brush. So to me, I see like a big shape here. I see a big shape here. The eyeball is a shape. There's like a shape here. And if, if you look at their work, you'll see a lot of that. Um, so I'm trying to get my hand back into that because and it will be easier for me, I think, when I go to doing the self-portraits, I think it will actually be easier for me to do it that way because then I'm not so concerned about getting his shapes right. I'm just reacting to a, a photograph. Um, and the, these lines, like just trying to play with the width chains all at once rather than trying to go back and do that later. That's, that's where the beauty of people like Raymond come from is that spontaneity of the stroke and the, the it all happened all in one go don't go back over and fuss with it much that's part of what I mean by drawing is like right there I just went and fussed with it. <laughs> some weird rap music coming in Sounds like we got taken over by aliens here. Let's see, where's that coming from? Okay, I'm, I'm muting, I'm muting some people. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute everyone, uh, but feel free to unmute yourself and talk to me. It seems like people are just logging in and we're getting background noise. But if you have a question, please do unmute yourself. It's a trick I've learned as a professor who's been teaching on, <laughs> on Zoom for a while now. Here's a good instance of using shapes. Like I can tell Raymond didn't go around and outline the hair. He did this series of choppy marks coming down into it. And they pile on top of each other. And I do have the original up on my screen to look at as well. Um, another thing is when I'm doing these, it's a weird mix between trying to be super accurate, but also like to feel like a Raymond, it's got to be spontaneous. So I can't just sit there and try and get it 100% the way it is on the paper because I would lose the spontaneity. Um, Raymond's actually a little bit easier to get pretty accurate, but also keep the 
sense of spontaneity stan drake is freaking impossible um because his lines are so wild that like you can't be that spontaneous and create the exact same line that he created it's really difficult to recreate stan drake's work it's a little bit easier to draw like him when you're just working working from scratch because then you can cut loose in the same way that he cut loose not claiming that I could draw like Stan Drake at all, but the style's a little bit easier to mimic. But to actually recreate a, any particular Stan Drake piece, I will admit that <laughs> I was very scared of getting to a Stan Drake heavy part of the book. Um, and I think those were coming up in the volumes <laughs> that had got left off you know, that they quit. And so there's a part of me that is grateful I never had to get exposed <laughs> by not being able to recreate Stan Drake. He was the most intimidating of all of them in my mind. Colin Murphy's actually pretty wild too, John Colin Murphy. especially his later stuff. He does a lot of dry brush. It's like, there's no way to make, there's no way to control dry brush. So when you have to recreate dry brush, it's like, well, there's no way I can make my brush do exactly what his did. So like, this is a good part where it's like, I could try and be 100% accurate, or I could try and capture the spirit of what's going on. And my inclination is to go for the spirit of it. Here, though, it makes sense to go back into because I can I can really see the individual lines and they're more controlled. See the fluctuations in line weight. But in this area, it just looks like he went real fast and crazy hectic. I'm excited to see so many people could log in in the, the middle of the week, in the middle of the day. I had a bunch of music queued up. I thought I was going to be all alone. As people are logging in, is is the image of me inking still like the big thing, or is it in lost in the gallery? Here, here's an important brush care. A lot of people in a big area like this are going to go back and forth with their brush. I find that it's way better for the brush. And this is kind of in the book too. Dave talks about making rectangular shapes. If, I'm sure most of you have, have read the preview copy already. So that part where he's talking about rectangular shapes this is kind of helping me do the same thing. Um, I actually modify that technique a little bit. I, I do the rectangular shape and I twist it at the same time. That's how I get the finest lines. I was never so good at the rectangle technique that Dave was talking about. I mean, if you can, if you can pull it off, it definitely works. 
but I still have a hard time even getting the brush to come to a perfect rectangular shape. Okay, that's all the big stuff. Now I'm gonna have to, well, actually here's some of those rectangular shapes. One thing I found very difficult is the way his shapes tilt at the end. I was talking about that in the video with Sean as well. Like they tilt this way, when I put them, they tilt that way. Which I don't know if he's, the only way I can get it is if I come up above the line like this. I'd be absolutely mortified if I found out he was just left-handed and I spent all this time thinking. I'll have to go back and look at the pictures of him. That'd be hilarious if I've been worrying about it. And these strokes that he makes, I can see that they're probably two or three of these rectangular strokes piled next to each other. That's something else that I started to pick up on. So again, going back to Simon's original question about did Dave give much instruction? Um, it, it was more just me trying to recreate things and I would ask him questions about what I was seeing, but Dave was actually generally pretty elusive. <laughs> about that kind of stuff. And I think that was to encourage me to like figure it out. You know, like if you figure it out for yourself, it's much, as a teacher, you always like hope that you can guide your student to figure it out for themselves. Sometimes you have to be more explicit. I had an instructor tell me to point to the moon without getting my finger in the way. And I think Dave did a lot of that. Like try to get me to the right spot, but without over instructing. How well that did or didn't work, I don't know. I guess he would have to assess that. Okay, good. Thanks, Brian. I'm hoping that when this records, because I've spotlighted my, my camera, that it, that's how it record, that it won't be this gallery scene. We'll find out, though. Things to learn. I'm really scared, and I shouldn't be, because it should be the easier part. I'm really scared to do this part. <laughs> Because Dave changed the how the word we don't need as much word balloons, so this is a part where I'm gonna have to just figure out. Okay, I have no Raymond reference there now. I'm just gonna have to try and pretend like I'm Alex Raymond after not having inked for a while, and hope it goes well. And unfortunately, I'm not too into sports cars, so I can't pretend that I just want to go race. All right, here we go.
Now, the nice thing about this shape style is I can decide to add to a shape fairly easily. So the shape by shape by shape approach. But it still doesn't look like noodly. It doesn't sit like I sat there and fussed with it much. It's I can preserve the spontaneity line. Okay, not bad. And I'm gonna have to make up more of these kind of blind blinds look anyway. All right, now into the fine lines. And when I look at this panel, this looks like one where Raymond, and I don't know why he did this, but Dave talks about it quite a bit, where he'd do the cross hatching in one direction with the brush. And so you'd get that thin to thick look of the line weight getting a little thicker. And then it looks like he would do the other direction with the pin and it's a more consistent line weight. It's an interesting look. Um, I think that's going on in here. So I am actually going to grab the pin in a second. But it's, it's a little odd. Yeah, I, for the hatching, I definitely also, I, mostly I try to not spin the board. I want to see the, um, I want to see the picture as it's going to look to the reader. But for the very fine hatching, try to move my head out of the way here there's certain directions that I have, like my hand just has more control and is more comfortable. And so I'm going to, I'm going to spin the board to get, get to that position. But I definitely can see how Dave's hand and wrist started to cause any problems. Because over the course of this project, I've had problems with my wrist and my elbow as well. There's just a lot of very tight control over the tool, over especially the brush. It's not as bad with the pen, but over the brush, there's a lot of very, very tight control to get these finest lines. I have some tricks with the pin that help me not have to be as tense. And I'll, I'll use those in a later panel, maybe even in this one. Definitely not. That's pretty good. Not the tiniest lines I've ever done. This is a really weird section right here. He's actually going in three different directions, which is odd for him. So that one I'm going to have to work small to big so I don't lose the lose the track of where, where what's going on where Once you get the brush down to the right point and you get 
it's a perception thing. Like you get your eyes locked into where the tip of the brush is at and you get your grip locked into where it needs to be. You can go pretty quick. And I do find that the faster I go, the, the better it tends to look. It's just always the risk as you go a little too fast, you could lose control over the weight of the line. How, like, I, I think those ones I made were a little bit thick relative to probably what Raymond did. And it's hard to know. Uh, I have a pretty high resolution image of this, but as me and Sean talked about in the videos, it's definitely a, a photograph, not a scan. And even with scans, you know, who knows what kind of blur there is. So we still don't know exactly. A scan would be better. But it's hard to guess exactly, especially when you're doing this, exactly how thick or thin a line should be. Plus in the blue, I have it pretty light. So I'm losing a sense of like it's total impact in terms of light or dark. On the image, I can refer back to that on my screen, but then there's problems of like the screen not looking so great as well. Um, so that's, that's a very difficult part of it. Um, it I, it can help me confirm like there's some stuff going on on the nose there that I could think was just noise. Um, so that looks like pen to me. Like he'll do that, that brush and pen trick a lot on the lips. which is weird. I don't know. I mean, it may just be that he can control the brush enough that sometimes it looks super straight like a pen. And sometimes it has variation more like a brush. I don't know. We're just speculating based on what we see when we're looking at scans of the originals. The density of the lines are surprising to me sometimes. They're, they're not as closely spaced together as I thought. Like when I was doing the work on volume one, I was putting stuff super close together. And then went like, cause I'd only seen scans of Dave's work. Um, but I wasn't really paying attention to them at size. And then when I finally printed some out at size, oh my God, I've been like wrecking myself getting these lines, not only super tiny, but like very, very close together. Cause I was, I was recreating more like what it looks like when it's shrunk down and printed. This all looks like brushwork to me in here. You might notice I'm spinning the brush a lot too. It's something I've noticed a lot of people who work with these brushes do subconsciously. Um, there is a, like I can start to see which is the direction that's gonna give me the line quality I want. And so I'll spin it around until that little tip is lined up. And I don't even know that I can say I consciously see the tip like it's 
it's obviously microscopic, so I don't know that I'm consciously seeing the tip, but I can tell by the curvature of the brush whether it's it's where I want it to be or not. Sounds a little crazy, but it's one of those Zen, like become one with the tool type of things. Um, these are definitely brush strokes. And I've never quite made up my mind about whether it's best to start thick and end thin, like with a flick, like I'm doing right now, or you could see some of the other, the other ones I was starting thin and working it into the black. I don't know. I can't explain why I would be making the decision at any moment, which way to work there. I'm sure there's something in the art that my brain is seeing that's telling me to go one way or the other. Okay, the rest of this stuff for, to me, for whatever reason, looks like pen line. So I'm going to use a pen. I don't care if he actually did or not. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, anyone can ask questions at any time, please. Great. So um, in the initial stages of this, like that panel you just inked. If when he's drawing it, is he actually using a model for each of these panels? Um, I don't know. Like he talks. I'm. I'm not. I. I didn't do a whole lot of like studying on this to become an expert. You know, that's the kind of stuff that Dave was really concerned with. I more uh -huh. just like got okay. What is Dave telling me to draw? I'm going to draw it. Um. From what I understand, sometimes he would make it up totally, and sometimes he would use a model. My instinct, and me and Sean uh, talked about this a little bit in that video, is that most of the time he probably wasn't using a model. He was just that good. Um, I think you get all of those photos of him with models in the studio, but they're always like, you know, someone's coming in to like, photograph him and then he has this whole like contrived to me it looks like a contrived setup to be like hey look at me I've got sexy naked ladies <laughs> right hanging around in my studio and I'm a rock star um so I don't know uh I'm sure there's like people who actually there's there's got to be accounts from like Ray Burns who was his assistant um talking about that that aspect of things. But to me, it looks like a lot of it is just, he's that, that good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, here's the trick I was talking about with the pin. Um, notice as I going in with the pin, I'm elevating the paper. This is how I, figured out to get the finest lines out of the pins. Um, I, what happened was during making the work for volume one, and if you look at the first couple pages of the book, if you have the California test edition, or if you, when you get the actual book, the, the very first page was actually, I think the fourth page I drew, uh, the opening scene of Kitchener. The first page I actually drew was page two, and you'll see that the lines on there are thicker, or at least it, I can see very obviously that the lines are thicker. Um, within a couple pages, and if, if you go back to that first page, the lines get much thinner, and that was because I was noticing at the, if I was inking up towards the top of my paper, Sometimes they were bent up and I was getting thinner lines up towards the top. And I realized that that was because um, the, the pin was actually just 
pushing the paper away from itself while it was making a mark. Um, if the paper is flat down, then the pen has some resistance behind it and that's gonna make the little tip of the nib, little nib tip flex out more. Um, so to get the finest line, you have to like really lay off the pressure to where it's almost like the, the pin is just resting. And then if you add the, the paper flexing away from that a little bit, um, there's as little pressure on the tip of the pin as possible. And so that keeps it at its finest point. Um, I have no idea if that's something that other people do but it's just become, it's become like second nature for me to grab the paper and lift it up now when I'm working with these, the, these speedball nibs, these Hunt 102s. Um, I think now they're just a speedball 102. Uh-oh, we lost the camera. I hope we didn't run out of battery. And we're back, okay. It might just be getting hot. It's kind of hot in here because I've got lights on to make sure this looks good. One of the cues I'm looking for on whether he's using a, a, a brush or a pen, by the way, is like the pens tend to have like a little dot at the end of their lines. So sometimes his stuff has like a dot at the end of the line and sometimes it more tapers out like feathers out so if i see a dot i'm like okay that's got to be a pin again i've done it where i recreate that look with the brush but it's like way slower so i don't know why you would do that but yeah with the pen i can go through here super fast especially with the paper lifted up like that uh, one reason I think you might switch between pin and brush is if you've got pin over pin, it does get, um, it kind of like scratches it itself. So if you do one brush and one pin, uh, looking at the original, this is all broken. I'm cheating, I'm using a brush pin real quick. an area. No? Okay, I think that one's done. Oh, and the camera turned off again. Give me just a second. I'm going to turn off some of the lights and, see, and go turn on the air conditioning to see if this camera can not overheat. Okay, hopefully that works. Let's check the battery. Oh, I still got plenty of battery. I think the camera's just overheating. Hopefully this will let us keep going. Okay. Um, so supposedly now that <laughs> we created Alex Raymond, I should be good to go on these other ones. I'm gonna take the tape here. So you see why I keep the tape on the, the edges. Um, the 
borders between the, the gutters between the panels. Oh no, too much moisture. Oh, we're gonna have to redraw back over that. That's not good. Gonna have to do some surgery here. We'll tidy that back up later. Um, so that means when I put the tape on this, I need to get some oil from my skin off of it. So it's not as sticky. So that's not good. This tape artist tape should come back up. I'm also not going to score it down on that side now. So much for the pristine piece that I was going for. I try and do these things without whiteout if I can too. Just like I know original comic art has all kinds of stuff pasted and cut and whited out on it, but coming from like more of a painting fine arts background, like I tend to think about trying to get the piece to to look like a finished art object. So when little things like that happen with the paper, it really stresses me out. Um, these are going to be probably easier, I hope. So something I'm, I do, I used to print out photos. Now I just kind of put them up on my computer screen. Um, I don't know why that's working for me lately. I think I'm less prone to like copy, copy, copy if it's on my computer screen. I'll look at it and get a mental idea of what's going on and then come back down. It was a lot of that came from the those. Oh, sorry. I'm seeing there's some questions off in the I'm, I'm not very likely to look at those chat stuff, by the way. Um, I see them now, so I'll answer them, but feel free to turn on your your audio. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else is having this issue, but I'm, I'm Carson, I'm seeing a um, A lot of that, where that came from though, where I was drawing off the computer screen came from those Google grab bag images that I did for the You Don't Know Jack campaign. Um, I got so used to just looking at the thing on the screen and I, I like the results better. Uh, Robert says, in the initial stage of the drawing of the panels, oh, okay, we already answered that. Um, Brian, did I have to do preliminary sketches of the pages? Me personally, I'm assuming. Uh, I know, Brian, I never had to do sketches for the book because Dave, and that's what that one book that we're releasing with the campaign will be. That's um, the photo mock-ups that he gave me were always like exactly what he wanted. And then I would just, any preliminary work I did, it was always in Photoshop. That tends to be like, same thing for the end of the book where like I, I wrote the book in the end, the final 30, 40 pages and, and I did all the layouts and everything. Um, there was no sketching involved at all. I, I worked entirely in Photoshop. S same way that I think Dave doesn't, unless he's doing like a sequence where he has to make something up, my instinct from working with him is that he's working entirely in a collage process, like just having all the photos of what he wants and then moving them around on paper. Because that's what I would get. I would get like these photo collage mock-ups and that was very useful for me 
because it's not like we have it's not like something like this where dave had to like figure out the pose and figure out the angle he wants we had a bunch of primary sources of photographs and panels from the actual strips themselves and the challenge is the design aspect of how to get them to all sit on the page in the same way in an interest ah. I keep losing the camera here. The challenge is to get them to like sit on the page in a way that's well designed and compelling and kind of makes the point that you're trying to make. Um, and collage seems to be better for that when you have these like ready-made materials that you're, to use the art terms, appropriating from somewhere else. All of that awful appropriation that we're doing. Oh, we're losing the camera again. I'm just filling in black now. I'll switch over. I'm gonna let the camera rest for a minute. It seems like it's overheating. I'm just feeling I'm just spotting in blacks. So we're not missing much. I'll try and answer questions. So while I'm going, uh, here's me, I'm in my room. Put up a bookshelf. So we look cool when we're doing our living the line videos. Um, this panel that I'm working on now. Oh, sorry, going back to um, Ryan's question. So that was my process. I, I really heavily worked in Photoshop. And it was really fun because the compositions made themselves almost like you put okay, I need this thing. This is like, what I'm trying to talk about. This is the first image that relates to that. And so I'm put that on the page and then, okay, I got this other one. And how am I going to fit that into what I'm already doing? Um, and I wound up being very surprised. Like it was almost, especially when you take what Dave is saying with the book seriously, you know, that there's these like, entities or whatever you know the, the, these higher kind of influences that are happening um or there's these resonances that are being encapsulated in the image images of these old comic strips that are relevant uh, when you start collaging these things together you you start to see those coincidences of information and um they put themselves together in a really neat way. It, it was almost like too easy. You know, like you, you think like you should really have to sit there and make these things work. And I'd be putting pages together and then there'd be associations that I didn't even realize I was making until they were on the page together. And I was like, oh crap, that that's like really, that works really well with this thing Dave did earlier in the book. I'm gonna go grab that. And oh man, that image is like just the perfect size. So there was a lot of, that kind of stuff when I was doing my own pages. And I suspect Dave encountered a lot of that as well. Uh, so it, it was really exciting working on those final 30 pages or whatever, because of that process. Um, and then Claude, there's a paper overlay on the I'm not sure on panel three. This is all just printed out in the blue line. Let me see if I can get this camera back on now. So Claude, I think you're asking about this, this panel. This is the same as the other two. I've just pre-inked the, the word balloons, but it's all printed in the, probably gonna lose focus as we get close. Yeah, it's printed in blue line 
is maybe what you're seeing where it looks like there's an overlay. So I traced this all. I actually, I made a whole like hour and a half video of me doing all of the digital work that I do. Um, I did that the other day when I was preparing this and I had it all ready to go. And when it saved, like when I hit the save button, it, the file corrupted. So we lost that forever, which was awesome. Um, Cause I think that is a part of the process that a lot of people are curious about is how we're doing this. Um, me using the digital and, and Dave is more, you know, doing the same thing I'm doing, but doing it analog with copy machines and tracing paper. Right now I'm, I'm going to just ink all the background of this because Dave does, I, I think Dave is planning on releasing a print of like me and Sean are going to release the eight by three print on the, on the tan paper to try and make it look like an old newspaper strip. Dave is wanting to, and he had wanted to do this in the campaign and I just didn't have time. He had wanted to do a print of just the first panel with, I think him inking me and me inking Cerebus or him inking me on the first panel and me inking myself on the third one. But he, he's talking about doing that on every print. So it's not just a print, it's actually got hand inking, like some of it's printed out and some of it's actually re-inked over every time. And I was like, Dave, I just, you know, if we sell like 200 of these things, I don't have time to go draw my own face 200 times over, like I'm super busy right now. So I'm going to not ink my face right away. I'm just going to do the background and then scan it so he can print out that copy and do that. I think he's still planning on doing that at a later date, not as part of the campaign, which will be cool. I, I've never seen Dave draw me. It was fun to see him draw Jack. The one or two times he did that for you don't know Jack. Uh, oh, okay. This is pretty weird. I'm getting to ink. I'm being the background artist on a service strip. That is very surreal. I'm a bit sad that I'll never, like this will get sent to Dave and he'll do the service and I'll see a scan of it, but I'll never get to see it in person. He's gonna auction it. I would like to see the, the thing with both of our hands on it but that's okay. I'll see a scan of it. Some lucky soul. We'll get to sit there and stare at it. How do you guys, does anyone that's in here do their collect original art? And if so, like, what do you do with it? Do you frame it? Do you keep it in a basement somewhere and hope it appreciates in value, but never look at it? Something that's really hard for me to let go is not filling in exactly everything. Raymond will do this where he's um, like his shapes don't go right up to the word balloon and he's happy with the gap in between. I wish I could let myself be. Uh, it looks way better, but I'm like OCD about getting these things filled in. 
I'm getting a little better. I'll accept little gaps. He had better things to do. Okay, Vetus puts the paintings on a wall and the artboards in a portfolio. That makes sense. Do you still pull them out and look at them though? Like they're in one of those plastic portfolios that you'd like take to a convention to show to an editor. Yeah, okay, good. I just wonder if there's people out there who like get the stuff and look at it once or twice and then never look at it again, which would be just tragic in my mind. And something, I don't know if people can get a sense of it or not, but I have, I have shirts that I call inking shirts. And it's just like t-shirts that I don't care about. They're intended just for me to use while drawing. And I, you can see me doing this with my pen. I, I, I wipe my brush on my shirt. That's one of those things that I think has helped me be able to like just keep drawing just keep drawing just keep drawing and not always like run off to the sink to like clean my brush out um i don't know anything i can do to stay in the flow the other thing it lets me do is like with the pen nibs um a lot of times the pen nibs i'm gonna get a new nib because i want to do some super teeny tiny lines in the background here um the other one was getting a little thick hopefully this is a good one but the pen nibs a lot of times get paper built up in them and you got to pick them out and then you get ink all over your fingers and then you're likely to touch the artboard and like I said I try and not do white out if I can help it and all that so I can just pick that out with the shirt as well so I have these shirts I look like a crazy person but um, it's something I've done for a very long time I can also wipe the, the nib on my shirt that's very helpful so I'm going to do a test real quick of this nib to make sure that it gets the kind of line I'm looking for. Yep, pretty tiny. Uh, my ink is feeling a little thick today, so I'm also going to maybe dip it in water just a little bit. Hey, darling. You got a big box of Rice Krispies there? I need to eat. Yeah, you should. Me, I need to eat. Or you need to eat. I need to eat. Yeah, you should eat. I went to the neurologist. You went? Yeah, you have to go in if you get referred by the emergency. And? Um, I scheduled for July 14th, but she said if I keep calling, it might get me in sooner. Okay, good. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad it wasn't imperative. Well, they don't even have my records, so I like, can't even get them from DCH. Well, I mean, it's just yesterday. Yeah, they, she just said that they've just been having problems in general with it, but I don't know. She said as soon as they can, they'll look at it, but for now, that's the plan, so. Okay, yeah. good. I'm glad you went. Yeah. I love you. I love you, too. nothing super serious as far as we know there um so i'm getting this i use the pen when i'm cross hatching the backgrounds um, i use the brush if i'm doing fine cross hatching on clothes the pen feels more mechanical you know and so it makes sense to me on walls and whatnot um, the brush because it's more organic feels better on clothes. So like when I draw myself, I always wear jeans and I think the matching with the brush on jeans is perfect. Looks so good, but on a wall, yeah, I'm gonna switch over to the pen. And notice again, I'm doing that thing where I lift the paper up 
And because this is mostly going to be an original, I'm going to try and like really go crazy on the cross hatching. This is where the wrist starts to hurt very badly. So given how much of this kind of stuff Dave did, not surprising to me. Um, but right now I'm just trying to create something that's a little bit of a show off so that this piece is like, like I think at some point in the book, I opened up with the lines a little bit because I started thinking about how it would reproduce. I know we're going to print this at small size, but I'm really thinking about this as like a nice piece for somebody to own. So I'm going to try and get these lines as fine as possible and as densely packed together as possible. Um, the pain I experience from this, as far as I know, is in my ulnar nerve. So my ulnar nerve is like on this side and runs up to my elbow. Um, similar to where Dave complains about, but uh, his seems more located in the wrist. So I don't know if he's experiencing the same thing as me or if he has something else. But there's a lot of very tight control. And like tension to do what I'm doing right now. Lifting the paper definitely helps. Because I can put more weight, which gives me more control with less tension on my arm. I can bear down on the paper a little more because it flexes away it still has that like finest line possible. If you don't have that, you almost have to have to actively pull your hand away from the paper. And it's hard to do that and get like a really controlled line at the same time. And that's where I get just pain and a lot of tension. And it's so much easier when you get into these smaller spaces. There were passages in Strange of Alex Raymond where there's these, just these huge spaces that need to be covered with cross hatching, and that was so difficult. Um, Dave did it a lot, and I started picking up on what he was doing where you actually don't go the whole span. But if you're really controlled, like when it prints, it all looks like one long line. But if you actually see the original art, you can tell it's broken up into multiple shorter lines that are all stitched together. And that kind of gets hidden in the cross hatching. Like when it's just hatching like this, going in one direction, it shows up a little bit more. But when you start cross hatching, it's less obvious. Something else that can really kill the wrist is st stopping, especially stopping the, the exact right spot every time. Um, so it's always nice when there's like not a line to stop on, but a big body of black. I'm sure Gerhard must have talked about that too. That I don't know how that guy's wrist still is held up. It's pretty amazing. So being able to stop on black like right there is just a godsend. And now I'm going to get into these super long. So far, I've been able to maintain a pretty steady hand throughout this process. Even on these long passages. But I'm sure within a year or two, that's going to go away. Like if we had had to do another two or three volumes, I don't know, my, my hand might have given out as well. Which is sad to think that Dave did like 25 years of this stuff and then 
two volumes of Strange Death before his hand gave out and mine gave out after. Like less than one one volumes worth probably. I don't know how many pages I did in total. So when I'm doing this stuff, I'm definitely going to turn the paper to the most comfortable direction. So I don't need to be looking at anything. I'm just creating flat tone and that's fine. Shorter spans are, oh my goodness, so nice. Now we'll go the other way. Now here I've got a big area of black that I can tap out into. So I can go faster and it feels way better on the old wrist. Um, as I get to here, I'm going to tilt it so I can come towards the tape. This is another reason I put the tape on there. I can tap out in the tape. and start the line at the word balloon instead of ending it at the word balloon, which would be a nightmare. Now in here, there's just no option except to do it the hard way. Now luckily it's small. And this is a super difficult. Because here I've just got white on both sides and I'm trying to set it up so I don't even need to have like a contour line there. I can just have gray on white. Okay, now I can end out in the black. And please, if y'all have questions, keep asking questions. One thing that's really frustrating if you're being super OCD, which you kind of got to be on this project, the pens will get like paper fibers in them. So all of a sudden you'll think you're good. And then you put down some thicker lines in an area of hatching. And like, you know, to me, it stands out as like 
oh man it got so much darker and thicker there and it's just it drive you crazy but there's nothing you can do about it you just have to roll with it like i'm gonna try and go back in and even it out because it got a little thicker there Also, OCD about edges, um, you know, Raymond and I don't even think Dave is as OCD about stopping right on the edge. Like if their line goes over a little bit, they don't seem to be too worried about it. Okay, I think that's all the hatching, I, crazy hatching I got to do. Oh, I'll put that in the camera. So I got all that area of gray. Um, no, I am going to have to to scan that panel before I draw, draw my own face. So I'm going to do that real quick. Because I do want to finish that panel before I move on to the, the final one. So I have a big scanner off to my left here, which can handle up to 12 by 18, which is good because we're normally working at 11 by 17. Um, it comes with a printer that allows me to print at 11 by 17, and it's pretty cheap. It's the Epson Workforce 7720. And that has been an invaluable tool for all of this. I think I got it for like 250. They're more expensive now. And when I scan this stuff because of the fine, fine lines, we scan them in color. So Sean can drop out those blue, the blue lines that I was inking over. And we're doing it at 1200 dots per inch, which is really, really high resolution scan. But it, it captures all of those really teeny tiny lines. Oh, that scanned crooked. Oh, well. To share my screen here. Might as well, hey. Well, not the best thing in the world that it's scan crooked, but not the worst. Are you all like, you all logging in from work? That would be awesome. Or do you get to work at home? <laughs> Good for you, Venus. I love it. Venus, do you work from home, though? Okay. I'm always too scared to do too much from work. Like I feel like they're just gonna be watching my keystrokes and stuff. Okay, so we should have now the scan. Ooh, that's faint. So I have the scan, and you can see the blue line is still in there. So we can use that to print out for Dave, and then he can ink on top of that. But he'll still have some idea of where the image is at. If Sean got a hold of it, he can go ahead and just drop that blue right out of there, which is why why I do it that way. Okay. All right. Now I can just finish thinking the darn thing. Hmm. 
then Dave wants this to be very much like that deep noir style. So I, I luckily don't have to do much work to get it to work. Part of the idea there was, like I said, he was talking about doing this as a print where we each hand inked on each print. So each print became a piece of original art. And so his thought was that this beyond noir style would allow us to do that without taking up too much time and it would allow his it's something he could do with his hand the way it is um, but even with that I just don't that could be so many so many prints because we're lucky and you guys will definitely order them <laughs> uh, but that's that's just a promise I couldn't couldn't make and didn't think I would be able to keep and still get everyone's fulfillment done. So I wasn't going to do that. But it does make this easier. I hate ink in my glasses, by the way. They're very difficult. trying to get like a consistent line weight with the type of curves they've got. Just distortions to the to the eyes that are always weird. This is, this is the fun stuff for me. This is where I can really go into that shape by shape mindset. And cause I'm not having to mimic someone else's shapes. It's easier. I think this is where like the Al Williamson influence can show up more. Um, he, he's kind of interesting in that he's a little bit in between Raymond and Drake in terms of like how chaotic he's willing to be like the chaos is more controlled than Stan Drake, but it, it's not as controlled and elegant as Raymond, which I think is why Dave holds him as like the tippy top. I asked him about that once and he, just kind of said that it would take too long to explain it. <laughs> if I didn't already see it, it would take too long to explain it. But I was trying to figure out, okay, what is, what is it that he's seen in Williamson that makes that the go-to style we're trying to mimic? I definitely learned over the course of the book to go faster 
and not free pencil. Like Brian, you were asking about sketching and stuff. I don't know if that included that like idea of doing a lot of preliminary drawing or working much in pencil, but this was by the time I got to volume two, I was just winging it like this over top, which is dangerous. There were some times where I got results I didn't like because of that, but for the most part, it, it to me, it looked fresher and more spontaneous. Although it seems like Dave preferred the the tighter stuff I did on Jack in volume one. I think by you by the time of you don't know Jack, I was also just winging it on top of the blue lines. But I was drawing a lot more uh, in, in volume one. I, I, looking back, I don't like how much drawing I was doing. I was too tight. I was, there was not enough abstraction. I think too accurate. Like in volume one, I never would have done what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Just. <sighs> you actually see that a lot with Williamson too. He lets the dry brush work to his advantage. Something that I don't, don't really see in Raymond a lot. Especially in hair, Williamson really liked that dry brush in the hair. I just got to find a place to put a couple super thin lines in the hair. Just because. Ears are really fun. Actually, though, I think this whole ear needs to be blacked out, which is unfortunate. Just for the lighting. The manly one has joined us. What's up, Matt? Oh, he's not going to log in and talk. Matt, I need you I need you to interview me while I'm doing this cuz I'm running out of material. We need that please hold vibe. I 
I'm not here and I can see that your mic's turned on. Let me make sure that my audio is still on. I don't know, Matt, it looks like you're you're unmuted, but if you're talking, I can't hear you. One of my least favorite things in the book is drawing my beard. So I don't really have a good beard. It's more just like scruff. And so I can't, I can't do too much there. But if I don't do something like the whole jawline disappears. It's like a cartooning solution I haven't solved. All the way. It will be it'll be interesting to see what Dave does there actually when he does his version of this same panel. Those are the kinds of things. Oh, and Steve is here. Hey Steve. Um Like someone was asking earlier about like how much instruction Dave gave me. It was it was more like seeing him do something that I had done and then seeing him do it would be like, oh, like that's the approach that I should have take took taken. Took taken. Definitely couldn't ask for a better throw you into the deep end education and illustration and comics making and jumping into this project out of nowhere. Ryan Coppola has entered the building. I hope Ryan turns on his audio and I can hear it because we talk a lot, but I've never actually heard your voice. Although I'm getting suspicious that my earbuds aren't working. Someone let me know in the chat. Are people trying to talk to me? And I'm just not hearing it. Uh 
Now this part's going to be tricky. This is where I was always so fascinated by how Dave and Gerhardt work together. It's like just, I want to leave room for Dave to do his thing, but I also want to finish off what I'm doing in a clean fashion. It's like, I don't want to get too close to what he's going to have to ink, but also I need to. It's, it's really fascinating how they did that. Okay, I'm just going to leave the rest of this alone. And if Dave thinks there should be some more value in there, he can put more value in. And because of the lighting situation, I don't think he's going to have to put tone over Cerebus. So there we go. We've got... I've got two of my contributions done. I'm going to put a little bit. Something else I've had to learn on this is where to just make stuff up. Um, I was usually prone to total accuracy and being literal to the source material. And I've had to learn to let that go. Um, that's something else that I just learned by watching Dave is where to, like with the lighting in this, the lighting's not going to be consistent and totally sensible. But just learning that it's okay. Like part of what we're doing here is making a, a convincing and compelling image um, so if the image works, like total accuracy doesn't really matter so much. Okay, so one panel to go. This panel is a little bit more compli complicated because we have a we have more going on with the background. Uh, but I'm gonna ink myself first. There's just more complex overlaps in this panel. I'm going to be really careful because Dave still wants that um, beyond law style. I want to be careful to not over overuse line on edges. Try and keep it all like shape and shadow. Like on this this edge of my arm. I'm going to just leave that alone and see if I can represent that with the background. And Dave had me holding a flashlight, which I thought was kind of like hilariously outdated. Um, and I get that we're trying to do Rip Curvy, but also I just thought it would be funnier to have me holding my cell phone. Like we have Cerebus doing the Rip Curvy thing, so I think we we can have some artistic license here. 
for messing with time periods and stuff like that. So I thought it'd be fun to be holding my cell phone as we're creeping through through this poor woman's room. Watching her sleep apparently is the gag. I would never, let's put that on record. Unless I was messing around with Tori. But then it would be a joke. Um, hopefully a well received. <laughs> Now this photo that I'm working from definitely doesn't have the lighting that we want. So I'm gonna have to make up some of the lighting situation here. Which is fun. And I'm gonna stray from I'm gonna stray from the beyond noir. A little bit and do some feathering. On the arm here. It just looks too noir. Up here it looks okay. Another stylistic thing that I learned is alternating thin lines against thick lines. That seemed to be something that was very prevalent, especially in Raymond and Williamson. have another choice to make here of whether I put shadow on my chest, but then that's going to bleed into the shadow behind there. And Cerebus is very going to be filled in as well. Very dark. So I think I'm going to leave that alone. Even down here, give it the pop that it needs.
And I'm tempted to do all the details in my jeans right here, but again, I know Dave's probably gonna color that in black. So I wanna leave him like something to contrast against. So I'll, I'm just gonna hatch into that area. And I can go dark on my face here because there's going to be there's going to be white behind the face. It's just like edge problems. Trying to figure out what you're going to do with edges. Oh, I finally heard someone. Okay, that's good. I love doing nostrils, but they always freak me out. Like you get them too thick. Like I just got that one a little too thick, but that's okay. If you do it right, it's just like this one perfect stroke. But it can go so wrong. Same with eyebrows. If you do the eyebrow with the one perfect stroke, it's the most beautiful thing. I'm talking about drawing versus inking. You'll see that when I'm in the face, I'm drawing more, kind of like a little bit more back and forth, more hesitant, not as confident. Because like likeness matters. So you can't, you can't be as like wild in those, those moments. Because if you go off off the mark at all, then it could look like a different person. Whereas with like blinds and you know curtains and fabric, it's you know 
no big deal. If it's anywhere near the mark, it'll look good. And you can kind of see that in Raymond's drawings too. There's more like sketchiness to the, the face. Oh, we lost the camera again. Give it a second to cool down. We'll get it back on. Okay, let's see. There we go. Back to the dang beard. Nope, the camera shut off again. I apologize for that. Me and Sean also recorded a video right before this, right before I got on here. So this camera has been doing work today. It's, a, it's just a DSLR, like, Canon. It can be used for streaming and video, but it's more meant for taking photographs.
Alright, let's see if this will work now. Make sure the battery hasn't run out of this thing. All right, we got another option here. Won't be as high resolution, but it'll work. Hey, there we go. We're back. Sorry about that. That looks pretty good, actually. Maybe I should just use that one. Let me adjust this. There we go. Now I can draw comfortably. Okay. Now I gotta make some curtains. Curtains in this style are fun. Just kind of do these big strokes. I'm actually going to get on the edge and just let my ear get caught up in there. Pop that out. And this is going to be shadow in here, so that's pretty great. I just draw right over it. shadow on there and this is all shadow something I like to do um, when I'm doing these big areas that works with the shape by shape is like I'm gonna connect this line to here and then add this shape on top of it connect this connect this connect this That actually keeps the, sh the corners nicer instead of trying to do like this where you get a softer corner. So it's good to overlap. Same thing in these scoops. Scoop up, come back down in, scoop up. That's going to make the points of that pointier than if I tried to draw points.
I'm going to outline that hand all in black and see if I even want to put any value on it. Like it might probably work just fine as like a white silhouette. And while I was working on this book, and I still get caught up in this, I was really interested in um, the order that they did things in. Like, did they block all their blacks in first? Did they do all of their thin lines first, like in an outline? Did they just kind of like I'm doing, just go piece by piece and just good enough with the tools that they could have a thin line if they wanted it, have a thick line if they wanted it? And I'm, I don't know. It's it looks similar to me to like what I do is sometimes one thing makes sense and sometimes another thing makes sense. Um, but there's a temptation to try and find like a standard approach. But I just don't know. I never, it's too hard to tell. We weren't there, we weren't looking at it. Just relying on assistance and people who stopped by the studio saying what they saw and that that could change on any given day I'm sure Don't like that that word balloon is tangent with the arm. The, the point of it comes right to the point of the arm, but trying to fix that at this point would make it even worse. It's okay, it's a word balloon. It's not something in the space, so. If it flattens out there a little bit, that's okay. Oh, and I need to sign this thing too. Dave had this pre, pre-made box for him to sign in. I had a different idea about how I was going to sign it. I don't normally sign my work. But that's been a really weird thing with all of this. Like everyone always has their rock star signature <laughs> that they've worked on for years to like sign stuff. I never ever thought about myself being in that position. And I don't ever sign my paintings because I feel like it becomes part of the picture and that's not supposed to be part of the picture. Um, so it's been really weird to have to sign a bunch of stuff because I don't really have like a cool signature. Okay, I do want that hand to have a little bit of A little bit of something. That's good. And I definitely need to cross hatch my pants. Okay, so like I said, if I'm doing a wall, I'm going to bust out the pin. If I'm doing fabric, and I'll do straight lines on a wall. If I'm doing fabric, I'm going to try and do the cross contour lines that me and Sean talked about in 
our video about the strange stuff of Alex Raymond, and I'm going to try and curve them, and I like to do it with the brush because, like I said earlier, it's organic feeling to me. So I can make the thing feel more three-dimensional. And what we were doing in the book, actually, for the jeans that I really, really liked, the texture it created, um, was I would do this cross hatching with the brush. And then Sean would digitally put in like a screen tone. So like the little dot tone pattern that Dave and Gare always used to get Cerebus to be gray, we would put that over the jeans and that combination of the hatching and the tone I think looked really good. Um, I really appreciate the way that looked. On the original, I don't think Dave's gonna put any tone on it because Cerebus is in pretty high light and is, if, if you paid attention at all to Sean's restoration stuff, you'll see that the tone doesn't age well. It turns yellow over time. So personally, I wouldn't want any tone on this. Again, to try and preserve it as like a, a piece. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is just get the weave of the cross hatching denser lines closer together and hopefully that will get the darkness that's necessary. Part of the reason we're adding the tone is um, I always wear gray shirts so we're toning my shirt gray with the dots but then that looked like that looked like the same value even though it's different textures like one's lines and one's dots it looked like the same value as the pants so we needed the pants to get darker plus the jeans were just darker anyways Although in this, I'm not going to tone my shirt either, so. The relative relationship between the values should be all right anyways. And whoever winds up getting this, you know, it will be worth it to look at, all right, like, can you see the difference between the hatching that's on these jeans and the hatching that's back up on the first panel on the wall? And like, what is the kind of visceral feel, the difference between the visceral feel of the two of them? Uh, you know, and that, that will give you a sense of like why we're, why I chose to do it the way I chose to do it. And the types of things we're thinking about when we're making those decisions. Okay, now I just have to do, well, I have to do some more curtains over here. Although I'm going to use a dry brush, even though this isn't a super... Raymond technique. Williamson would do this though. Because I want to get the fact that there's like a flashlight. Yeah, I'm holding my phone flashlight here. But 
then I'll do some I'll do some hatching in there too. Just to try and complete what I see the effect being. I'd be like Raymond, just leave it, leave it up there, leave it alone. I, mean, I think with the, the dry brush too, my instinct there is that it looks a little more like that crappy crushed velvet suede <laughs> that you would get on like red curtains. Um, I'm going to do this stuff here in pen. Well, no, I can do it in brush. Surprisingly, it looks to me like Raymond did a lot of his background straight lines. They weren't ruled out. It just looks like he does them in brush. So we'll go ahead and do it that way. And the goal here is really to not have to do any any line on the top of the arm there. Which I don't think it needs. Now it's tempting to go do a bunch of hatching in here, but I'm, I think I'm gonna leave it alone. And the ink up here is really watery. So again, I'm a stickler for like the finished product. And Dave kind of wants that like washy look, so I don't want to overdo it, but the ink is thin and so it has like these overlaps and I tend to go back and even that out, but I'll, I'll leave it because I know that's part of the look that he's going for. Um, so I think that's it. I need to sign it and then fix up the one spot where the tape messed it up. I'm going to take the tape off. I'm going to go way more slow this time. 
especially right there. Yeah, I need to fix that. Sadly. And the brush is going to be better than the pen. The pen would bleed. So, not ideal. actually do a couple of lines that weren't there just to mask it. So a little bit of messed up paper there because of the tape. Hopefully that won't, that, sh that shouldn't have happened. Uh, hopefully it won't happen again. This is a super exciting part. I'm sure for watch me taking tape off. It actually is exciting for me though, because there's a lot of overdrawing that happens onto the tape that looks sloppy and messy when I'm doing it. And I do really, really like right here where it's all messy. Uh, when I pull the tape off, that gets all like nice and clean. <laughs> and gets to that like perfect finished physical object that I like as, a, as someone who's thinking more about galleries oftentimes. Uh, we got some more. Let's take this off away from the camera. Like I think most comic artists, they don't really care. It's just like whatever's gonna get it to look good in print um, which is fair. Like I, I took that approach on volume two on volume one, I was doing crazy stuff like redrawing the same picture 20 some odd times or whatever. So it all looked like a nice original piece in the end. Uh, but volume two was like, no way. I just want to get this thing done. Like just draw it once and computer stat it in there, copy and paste in Photoshop. But then they're not they're not pieces that people want to buy this much either. Well, actually, I've sold a few of those, so who knows? What do I know? I don't know. And there we go. That is my contribution to Rip Cerebus. It came out. I was a little scared about this. I haven't drawn in a while. Uh, the last thing I need to do is sign it. So what I want to do is sign it with white ink. Um, I've always liked Frank Miller's signature when I was thinking about this this piece having that like very black and white start noir feeling to it so I think I'm gonna just try and do that
So one time I'll put white out on it. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Venus. And I'm assuming no one has any questions or else they would have been asking them. So I'm just gonna go, gonna go ahead and end the thing. Thanks y'all for, for um, popping in and watching me do this. Appreciate it.